Superman and Wonder Woman make an official statement about Sanctuary to the press, explaining about the murders. In what is probably the most realistic part of this whole scenario, regular civilians are indeed worried and scared about learning about the place, because a lot of people tend to not understand mental illness, assuming it just means criminal psychosis and mass murderers on par with the Joker or something. Which in turn leads to the stereotypes and assumptions that permeate media. Superman reassures the populace of how wonderful superheroes are, that sometimes the difficulties of this job are hard on them, that they'll smile outwardly while being plagued by scars and nightmares, that Sanctuary exists to help them recover from their pains and torments. And admittedly, if we weren't talking about the stupid AI system that had one job and sucks at it so much, it'd be a really nice moment for the book. What I don't understand is why they decided to have this speech over random images of various heroes doing nothing. It's not them reacting to the speech or showing them dealing with hardship. No, no. Here's Adam Strange standing on an alien world. Here's Shining Knight facing off against a dragon in what could be a Frazetta painting. Here's Swamp Thing's face. Here's Zatanna's face! What does this have to do with what Superman's talking about? Ugh, whatever. Here's what's actually important. A figure in a red glove picks up the rose that Harley had thrown off the bridge earlier. Impressive that they were able to find it days later, even knowing who it is. But more importantly, Booster and Ted's examination of Wally West's body reveals something odd, that it's five days older than it should be. Up to this point, there actually hasn't been that much padding. Ultimately, most of the stuff they brought up has had story relevance, even if it's presented in a weird way. Issue 6 is where we really, really hit the padding, and it becomes very clear where the comic is spinning its wheels a bit. It's another issue focusing on life at Sanctuary. And a good chunk of it is devoted to former teen titan Gnark, who is a caveman and apparently is now very well read, quoting philosophers as he pontificates endlessly about how different it is being a caveman in modern times. I've made this joke before, but it really does come across like a more serious version of unfrozen caveman lawyer. When I get a message on my fax machine, I wonder, did little demons get inside and type it? I don't know. But hey, that's just padding. It's not important. But then this comic really starts to piss me off again. We see more stuff from Wally in his little hologram chamber that are meant to be recreations of his escape from the Speed Force and reuniting with everyone. In particular, this shot of Wally hugging Barry, which is supposed to be the reverse shot of it happening in the Rebirth special. Wally, do you have... do you know what this means? This is the return of hope! He didn't say that. That was not a thing that Barry said in the Rebirth special. I know, I know, it's... wow, but... but Barry, where's my family? Wally didn't say that either! He remembered his wife, tried and failed to connect with her, but she didn't remember him! He didn't remember his kids yet! You took one of the greatest moments in recent years, when things were actually looking up for DC Comics, a sign of better things to come, and you changed it to some angsty dark fodder to justify your horrible story? It continues! Superman and the Titans hugging him and saying he's hope! He's what they've been missing and all he can say is, But where's my family? Nobody said that to him! Nobody told him, This means hope is back! Nobody tried to diminish the search for his family! They encouraged him to try to take it slow with Linda and hopefully start over again! King didn't bother to look into this stuff and how it actually played out! In an interview with Comic Book Resources, Tom King talked about the idea of coming home from war and trauma, and the responsibility thrust upon Wally. It's not a bad idea for a character exploration. Problem is, he was only the symbol of hope and rebirth in a meta sense to the fans! Everywhere else, he was an actual character going through his own journey. It's trying to give meta commentary on the expectations of fans and thinking it applied in-universe when it didn't! Ugh! We see Wally getting killed again, only this time it's by Booster Gold. Going into the next issue, we discover who it was who took that flower and is now planting it amidst a bunch of other flowers that spell out heroes in crisis. Wally West. Eh, points on your gardening skills, Wally, but couldn't you have spelled out a better event comics title? At our wedding, Linda read a poem. I haven't read it myself, but others have pointed out, no, no she didn't. There was no poem reading at their wedding. For the love of God, comic writers, if you're going to talk about important events in a character's life and potentially retcon them, 
maybe bother to actually read them? Anyway, Harley and Batgirl catch up with Booster and Ted. Harley's determined to kill Booster, but his force field is working again thanks to Ted. Oh, and more confusion about which continuity this is. Batgirl says she doesn't usually work like this. She usually works with Batman or Nightwing. Even though Barbara worked with Ted before in the old continuity when she was Oracle. For some reason, Ted tied in the power system to Booster's shields to the bug, which in turn is tied into Ted's consciousness. So Batgirl knocks him out so Harley can get past the shield, just casually telling her, hey now, don't you go killing him even though you really want to for murdering the woman you loved. Just layers and layers of idiocy across this story. An onion of stupid! Booster just tells her to kill him, saying that he has no self-worth and has failed the future and the past. Which, hey, maybe we finally have an understanding of the problems plaguing Booster. They are not at all consistent with any other time he's been shown in comics, but when the hell has that stopped this book? Harley elects not to kill him and just collapses next to him, and they talk for a bit about nothing. I'm not very good at superheroing. Yeah, me neither. You saved the multiverse! So, anyway, that flower Wally planted, some speed force energy comes out of his hand and into the flower, which rapidly grows and out emerges a new poison ivy, who's naked but looks like lettuce now. I don't get it myself. I know others are big fans of poison ivy who have a problem with this because they basically turned her into a low-rent swamp thing, but it's not actually relevant to the plot and I don't know why they even bothered to do it at all. Or even bothered to do this book at all, frankly. With the realization that if Wally's body is five days older than it should be, it's possible he's still alive and time travel shenanigans are afoot. Using Ted Kord's satellites along with Skeets' ability to detect temporal anomalies, they figure they can track down Wally and try to help him. Ted wonders if they should tell the Justice League, but Batgirl thinks that if Wally is hurting, it's better to have a small group approach him. Eh, on one hand she's probably right, but on the other, if, as they suspect, a villain is responsible for this, having some bigger guns might be a good call. So we enter issue 8 and, well, here's where everything hits the fan in this story. Wally confesses what happened that day at Sanctuary. He felt alone while there, even though the AI kept telling him he wasn't, that others were going through the same problems as him. However, in his depression, he didn't believe it and thought that he was the crazy one and everyone else was sane and that the League had just set up this whole Sanctuary thing just for him, a lie that everyone else perpetuated. Why is it anonymous? Why doesn't anyone know about it? Why are we hiding? You would think that people with secret identities would understand the concept of privacy. Wally needed some kind of proof that other people were going through the same kinds of difficulties as him, but the AI said everything had to be anonymous and that all the data is cracked into billions of bits and scattered in a billion places. It's a puzzle that it'd take the average man a few billion years to put back together, it said. Then I said, right, and it'd take the fastest man alive a few seconds. And so he admits he did just that, collecting every scrap of data, piecing it back together. How? How, Wally? Are there any computer terminals here? Are there keyboards? Do you have access to all the data storage systems? Do you know how to recover deleted data? Because it's not just like a physical puzzle piece you can hunt and put down somewhere. It's information that has been deleted several times over. Oh, I guess he ran really fast. That's how it's portrayed in the comic. In an instant, I experienced the totality of a thousand heroes in crisis. For an instant, I wasn't alone. It broke me. Okay, that's not how his speed works. It looks like an instant outside of it, but it's not like he just downloads all those experiences into his brain at once or something. He went outside to breathe and collect himself, but his actions triggered the alarm that got everyone else to go out too. But then we get a fundamental misunderstanding of the Flash's power. Here's the thing that speedsters don't tell you. The speed force is a gift. The greatest gift. The greatest power. But it's also, and I'm not complaining, I'm just saying, it's a burden. Having that inside you, and I've had it since I was a kid, it takes control. Every second of every day, you're pushing back at something. You're making sure the world's most dangerous weapon stays put. That it stays inside you every day. Every second. 
And after that. That's not how the Force works. The Speed Force is something that speedsters tap into. While Speed Force energy can be internalized, it's not some eternal burden that they must be constantly in control of. That's freaking ridiculous. How would they ever be able to sleep or even concentrate on any other task? The single most important event of this book is based on a false premise. But yeah, being broken after seeing all that hurt gets him to lose control and unleash that energy, killing everyone there. It's a pity that the super science and advanced skills that were performed in previous autopsies of superhero crime scenes never turned up the fact that they were electrocuted. Then again, given the track record of the Trinity so far... Running inside of Sanctuary to try to find something to help, since he apparently reprogrammed Sanctuary and thus had control of it somehow, he spotted Booster Gold and Harley Quinn, who had been a little slower to respond to the emergency exit call, and thus he hatched a little scheme. Using his super speed to put them right back into their holodecks without them realizing they'd moved, and created scenarios by which they saw the other person being responsible for the murders. In turn, he stole Booster's time travel technology, disabling his force field in the process, and traveled five days into the future because... Because... Because the Kool-Aid Man is red. I don't know, it makes about as much sense as anything else. He tells his past self to grab the Poison Ivy Rose, causing a predestination paradox, and then got ready for his past self to kill his future self, bring the body back, rearrange the bodies to make it look like either Harley or Booster could have done it, reprogram the AI again to cover his tracks, destroyed the Sanctuary robots, and left the message about puddlers because of some asinine thing about puddlers never really living because the job was so difficult that it made them sick and killed them young. The bodies. Booster, Harley, their fight, the puddler. It worked. It all distracted everyone. Made everyone focus on the murders that weren't and the suspects that didn't. You know, the best murder mysteries are the ones that no person could ever reasonably figure out the answer to and instead come up with a ridiculous, mind-boggling, what in the name of God, the devil, and everything in between were you thinking kind of explanation. What? Why? What? 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 A lot of people were thinking that this would lead to a Combine Harvester bit in this episode, but that feels wildly inappropriate because that is a gag designed around me breaking from how stupid the thing is. Except this is a story where Wally supposedly broke and did nonsensical things. So yeah, sorry, not happening this time. I will do this though. Look at the pretty bunny! Look at the pretty bunny! Go on, look at it! Look at it! It's vastly more entertaining than this story! So Wally says this gave him five days to do something as good as what he'd done bad, and to tell the truth. This leads us into the final issue, where we have a crap ton more confessionals, most of them just a single panel. Some of them meant to be funny, some of them meant to be poignant, some of them... confusing, like Cole here. She's alive again? What? And then some are just, well, see for yourself. I don't even know what the hell Will is. You an idiot. As past Wally prepares to kill future Wally, Booster, Ted, Harley, and Batgirl arrive in the bug and do some epic posing. They've worked out what happened and have interrupted the literal murder-suicide going on with the two Wallys. Oh, and as I mentioned earlier, the Trinity aren't even a part of this. Isn't it great when the story was framed in a way to show them investigating this and they're not even involved in the finale at all? No, 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 no. The real detectives are here. Two people suffering from severe trauma that's impairing their judgment, a guy who busted one of them out of a cell, and a woman with her costume so far up her ass it must be affecting her judgment too. Happy reunion for Harley and Ivy, then back over to the Flashes. Past Wally says he has to die for what he's done, but future Wally says he doesn't. Because he's not truly alone. Our little Greek chorus of heroes do some really bad, inappropriate comedy while Wally gives this massive, rambling speech that I'm sure is supposed to be inspiring, supposed to be reassuring to those who suffer from mental health issues about trying to do good things but only doing bad, feeling betrayed by friends, and that you need to talk to people and get help. And it all rings so freaking empty. Because that's not what this story has been about. It hasn't been about telling the reader that those with mental health problems deserve kindness, patience, and assistance with their problems. It hasn't been about depression or dealing with trauma. It's been nine goddamn issues saying, 
These people are damaged and dangerous, and you should lock them up before they hurt themselves or others. It's been saying, we have this super duper awesome AI made of the best heroes ever, and even they can't help. It's been saying that they'll frame other people for their crimes, that they have no grasp on reality, that they're fragile and easily broken. And I think it should go without saying, but I'll say it anyway, that's horse crap and does not reflect reality. And you know what makes the whole thing even worse? Tom King admitted that he didn't even pick these characters to use. Yeah, seriously. And it's not even a case of, well, he wanted to use this character and they wouldn't let him, so he put a square peg in a round hole. No, 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 no. He had the story he wanted to tell already and then asked his editor who he could use in it. This is confirmed in that same comic book resources interview. So this is not even a case of a writer wanting to advance the stories of certain characters. It's of a writer who had a plot and shoved in characters who had no business being involved in it into the plot. Here's a thought. Maybe your big crossover event comic dealing with very serious, real themes should not be written via Mad Libs! This book relies heavily on stereotypes and just short-sighted, bizarre choices that make it clear that they didn't care about the larger ramifications both from a thematic standpoint, but also what it would do to the characters involved in it. Of course everyone feels like they're not acting like themselves! Because they're not! They're some generic placeholders that got shoved in there! Ho oh, ho ho, but on the subject of out-of-character behavior, one of the other artists on the book, Mitch Gerards, had a choice quote in another interview. A lot of people were like, Oh, Wally would never break like that. But that's kind of the point of the story. When you break, you do it out of character. That's what breaking is. People don't break in character. What a freaking cop-out! That's basically saying, oh, we can write them however we want, as long as we just say they're crazy! Hey, when you break, you do it out of character, eh? <laughs> well, maybe they just wouldn't break! I'm reminded of the killing joke, actually. The Joker's argument in that book was that one bad day was all it took to break someone. Jim Gordon went on to prove that, no, he would not break even after the worst day of his life. And whatever other problems the killing joke has, that is still a theme that resonates with me. Wally West's trauma didn't break him, DC broke him. Bad writing broke him. And I hate that I still have to say this after all this time, but while I am critical, while I am disparaging this work, and it deserves to be disparaged, for the love of God, do not attack the creators! Do not send death threats! It's a bad story, and we should criticize a bad story, but don't become a goddamn supervillain yourself! Tom King got death threats over this, and that is so much worse than a bad story! Anyway, the monologuing continues, explaining why he didn't just use the time machine to travel back and undo the deaths. Because of Flashpoint, which resulted in the creation of the New 52 universe. And that's fair, given their track record, it's likely whatever timeline got created from another attempt to change history would probably be a thousand times worse. Like, Superman was Darkseid or something. So he wanted to do something good to make up for what he did. And that's reveal all the information about Sanctuary. If they knew we were making mistakes, getting help, what that help meant. What happens when you don't get that help? Maybe they'd get help before before they made mistakes like I'd made. You were theoretically getting help and still ended up accidentally killing people. Oh, and again, not your call to reveal this stuff. But he needed time to set all that up and get everything ready. Hence the five days. Didn't seem to stop you when you were moving at super speed doing everything else. And yet he still felt he needed to atone for what he'd done. Maybe by dying, I can help a few other people who are still living. Oh, get off the cross. We need the wood. As the two Wallies hug each other and weep over what's happened, the Greek chorus chimes in with more inane shatter. He leaked the secrets about Sanctuary to make up for it. That's good. It's good. No, it isn't! Go to hell! They figure that the League will detect them in another couple minutes, so they decide to do what they need to. Help him. Booster suggests that nobody has to kill anyone. All they have to do is supply a dead body in the past. They'll use the time travel technology to go into the future, create a fast-growing dead clone of the future Flash, and then just drop the body off. If it's that easy to just place 
a dead body like that so the timeline is preserved, why don't you just do that for all of them? Oh, sure, he says they have to break into a place in the 25th century to do this, but considering that happens off-panel, I have a funny feeling it's a pretty simple operation. Young Flash asks, shouldn't, as a hero, he sacrifice himself, but Booster just says, nah, they're brothers and sisters. Bros before heroes. Bros before heroes. And then Harley knees Young Flash in the dick for framing her and killing Ivy. Yeah, that seems fair. Oh, and our final page of confessionals. So, um, back in the Daredevil Born Again review, I gave a content warning because I've been told by some fans that they let their kids watch these videos with them because I don't use the more intense swears in them. And, and the Gordon Ramsay clips, of course, use a lot of adult language. And the story itself was, was pretty heavy on adult themes that may not be appropriate to younger viewers. So, um, just a, just a tiny warning here for what's about to happen. Do what you feel is necessary at this point. Even Raven has this confessional. My father loves me. Fuck you. Fuck you. Fuck you forever. Fuck yourselves. Go fuck yourselves, you fucks. Feel free to apply that to this entire story, frankly. But as a Teen Titans fan, that one just especially burned. And so our comic ends with the plan working. Wally admitting that he's lost Linda and his kids. They're gone. Ha! Nope. More on that in a bit. And he's now in prison. With a panel clearly showing that they rebuilt Sanctuary, probably with the same god-awful artificial intelligence. The narration is actually pretty good here, talking about hope in a manner that's actually much better than how Secret Empire used it, but I'm not going to dignify this garbage. This comic sucks! It is the worst event we have covered here in the 12 years I've done this show, and it only barely qualifies as an event. There are tie-in issues, but not many. I think I have made clear by now all the various problems of this comic. The characters are idiots. The dialogue is stilted as all hell. The message is muddled and it pointlessly killed or severely harmed characters. This story understands mental health as well as a dung beetle does. And as my introduction probably pointed out, a lot of people wanted me to cover it for that reason. This is Hal Jordan's turn to evil for a whole new generation. The artwork is a mix bag. In some spots it's gorgeous, but in other spots it's trying way too hard to be artsy for its own sake, instead of having a solid meaning behind its artistic choices. The good news is that almost immediately DC got to work trying to fix this mess with the miniseries Flash Forward. It's not a great story, but it's a hell of a lot better than this. In it, Wally is recruited by some cosmic being named Tempest Fugonaut, comic books, to help deal with a bunch of stuff relating to the light and dark multiverses, which is something introduced in the event comic Dark Knight's Metal. In it, he ends up finally rescuing his children and returning them to reality, though in the process, for whatever reason, he ends up in Metron's Mobius chair and then obtains the powers of Dr. Manhattan from Watchmen. I'd say that's another case of me shrugging and saying comic books, but really it's more a case of DC not knowing when to leave well enough alone. So some of you may be wondering, especially in light of everything that I've talked about with these event comics this year, why do I even care when heroes get killed? Why do I get passionate about heroes who are turned evil? Won't it just get undone? Won't they be heroic again? Won't the dead just rise again? Well, here's the thing. Danny Chase is still dead. Oh, don't you remember him? He was the telekinetic kid in the New Teen Titans. Abrasive little brat. Got on the fans and his fellow team members' nerves. He's my favorite superhero of all time. He died in 1992. And aside from being turned into a zombie minion once or twice, he has not come back to life in 28 years. Hal Jordan was a villain for two years, then dead for eight, regardless of his status as the Spectre, still seen as a monster and villain for his actions by most people. The superheroine Ice was dead for 13 years. Cassandra Kane was turned evil and only got turned back so quickly due to immense fan backlash. Stephanie Brown? Dead for four years, only resurrected so soon afterwards due to immense fan backlash. Batman's supporting character Orpheus, on the other hand, 
Still dead after 16 years. Barry Allen was dead for about 23 years. Dan Garrett, the original Blue Beetle, has been dead for 54 years. My point, in case it is not clear, sometimes they don't come back. And if they do, it's only because people demand they come back. And sometimes people are turned evil, and it lasts a long time. Unless people demand it be changed. I joke about this stuff because death only seems to matter if nobody in charge cares about them. And in that case, it doesn't matter. Will Roy Harper be back? Probably. I'd say he has enough fans in charge. But Hotspot? Gnark? Lagoon Boy? Probably not. That's why I care when DC and Marvel kill their characters. Because they don't. Next time, indie comic called Dinosaur Rex. If something with that title is not more fun, then I think fun might be dead too. This is perfect. Smells like America. Smells like it just got invaded by Hydra. Hello, my friends. Please be sure to like this video, subscribe, hit the bell, and share it with others. And if you get a chance, maybe check out my Patreon. 